Uh, and so, you know, my audience knows you already. They're expecting this. They're psyched about it. You're the original gangster when it comes to AI. And so, you know, it's been a lot of uh, hype lately, a lot of good stuff too. But you've been doing it for so long at such high level that it's kind of crazy. I'm I'm psyched to just be talking to you and looking at your beautiful face. So let's get started. Uh, what are you doing these days? Uh, so thanks for the for the uh, kind words, Old Touch. Uh, these days, uh, so after after leaving uh, Barclays Bank, where I was the global chief data officer, and and for a while I was the CIO of the risk finance and treasury technology as an additional uh, duty. Um, that was my way of learning financial services from the inside out, working at an international universal bank and definitely learned a heck of a lot. Went back to my uh, company, Open Insights, that I had founded way back in 2008 when I left Yahoo um, and started kind of engaging with a lot of uh, large companies, uh, sure. telcos, some banks on two fronts. Number one is how do we get their data in good shape so that it's available to be used for AI? And many people don't understand that every AI project essentially turns into a data project because <laughs> only AI that works today is AI that requires uh, uh, data because of machine learning. Uh, and the other part of it is AI that requires a lot of human intervention. Um, sure. And that's not talked about a lot, um, but it's essential. So uh, that's what I was doing with Open Insights. Uh, when the opportunity came uh, from Northeastern University to where they've done an amazing job of raising donor money as well as dedicating central university funds to say, we want to create uh, the top AI institute, research institute. Ambitious. Very ambitious. I like ambitious goals. Uh, <laughs> and after um, a quick discussion around this, um, I realized that it makes a lot of sense for me to become chairman of my company and not be running it day to day. So Open Insights is still going on, but I get involved as a chairman level. Uh, but my primary duties are I'm the inaugural um, director of the Institute for Experiential AI at Northeastern University. Uh, it is the largest institute at the uh, university. We aim to become uh, number one in the world in the area of experiential AI. And experiential mm -hmm. AI is basically uh, human-centric applied AI with the human in the loop. So we actually recognize upfront that applications are important and that's where most of the action in AI has been happening is in the applications and making it work on real problems. Mm -hmm. Number two is there's a huge dependence on the human in the loop capturing what the human knows, using the human to basically fix where the AI goes. Mm -hmm. uh, because the AI often goes in wrong directions. It has no understanding of what's going on. It has no understand. It has no common sense reasoning capabilities in general. These are problems that have been standing as unsolved problems for a good 70, 80 years now. Um, and the best way we know how to deal with them is to have the human give the direction and, and sure. the guidance. And this is really what happens from the Google search engine to the, the workings of uh, chat GPT at OpenAI, et cetera. There's a lot of the human in the loop that they don't talk about. And we, we can talk <laughs> about that separately. So the Institute is about pursuing these areas that say, okay, what does it take to really leverage uh, and treat every human intervention as an opportunity to capture knowledge, uh, provide adaptation to the, to, the, to the algorithm, to the AI, provide guidance, and make it better over time, uh, with, with, the, with the human continuously being a, a part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we're doing there, uh, uh, and this is very consistent with the ethos at Northeastern, is to say, okay, uh, we will actually engage with organizations and companies to source 
problems in the real world. So we will work with them in partnership on solving their AI problems. And most companies don't know how to approach AI the right way sure. to get it done. And we will use that solutioning to do two things. Drive a research agenda for our researchers and our faculty. And we have mm -hmm. about 100 affiliated faculties with, with the Institute who are at Northeastern. Uh, 65 of them are core AI faculty, meaning that's their primary research area as opposed to- Wow, yeah. that's quite a bit, no? A lot yes, of people. It's a, it's a large institute. Um, yeah, that's amazing. And we have, of course, our own research scientists, research faculty, and postdocs that we hire on top of all mm -hmm. of that. So it's it's a substantial kind of energy uh, working on AI, and we need to have make sure that the agenda is aligned with where the real problems are in the real world, because that is the opportunity to come up with the most interesting research problems, in my opinion. That's the mm -hmm. philosophy we took at Yahoo Research, and it worked when we were mm -hmm. trying to invent the, the sciences underlying the internet. Here, we're doing it the same way to say, how do we make experiential AI work and useful, et cetera? And the second and final dimension to this is um, in data science, because AI is highly dependent on data, in data science and in, in machine learning and in AI, there's a missing component in the learning side uh, from a... Uh, if you hire a fresh grad, and I hired many fresh grad data scientists and AI practitioners, the first two or three years are about them learning on the job because they don't quite understand that many of the issues uh, are much bigger than dealing with, you know, making an algorithm work on data. Mm -hmm. uh, the data can be wrong. The data can be half missing. Uh, the data could have changed over time. The requirements of the real world are very different. So the experience, creating an experience where they see what it takes to deliver on a real project, in a real setting, mm -hmm. real constraints, real dirty data, real issues, uh, gives us the opportunity to produce graduates who are better qualified to contribute to the job on day one than any other institute of higher education. By sure. the way, this is very, very much akin to what happens in medical school where you have um, people go through a residency program, they get thrown into a training hospital and as every you know, aspiring doctor quickly learns, hey, what I do day to day in this hospital has very little to do with what I learned in, in, in my classrooms, right? It has to do with how do I deal with nurses, with beds, with patients, with administration, with uh, you know different demands that don't get covered naturally in the classroom setting. Uh, and that is an essential part of the training. I believe, we believe that this is also an essential part of the training of a good AI practitioner or a good data scientist. Yeah, right, a good apprenticeship. Long sure. Telling you about no, this. Story. That's quite all right, I think. Uh, it segues very nicely uh, to my other questions. So I'm going to ask you, I mean, I know you do this uh, commercially and through the Institute and people like you were in Wall Street the other day and, you know, telling who knows who as to what to do and how to do it. So this time I'm going to ask for a, a freebie friendship advisory from you. If I were to put a gun to your head and say, hey, you got to start a, a startup like a tech startup utilizing AI. And now I know experiential AI is better. So yes, experiential AI, what have you, in FinTech, whatever that means, you know, asset management, robo advisory, bank infrastructure. So what would you do? By the way, I'm gonna steal the idea most likely. So, hey, <laughs> thank you. I mean, I, I, can, I can answer this one at, uh, at the principal level. Look. I think the opportunity for, for FinTech in general to actually revolutionize and transform the economy is, is still there and has been hardly tapped into. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've seen it kind of have an impact in areas like insurance with some of the you know, wearables and or tracking devices on cars, as an example, right? To, to mm -hmm. change the, the insurance model. But in general, where it's heading, is fintech is about figuring out how to uh, stripe or partition the 
the stack that you need to deliver a service, be it a payment or a banking service or what have you, mm -hmm. and embedded in events that are happening out there in the economy so that mm -hmm. I could actually make it part of a signing of a contract. You know, how do you set up the, the payments for it? How do you set up the uh, verification of, 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 of signatures and agreements? Uh, all of that leveraging things, whether they're blockchain or whether they're other technologies mm -hmm. um, to make it work more smoothly, more smartly, et cetera. So in that environment, which is very mm -hmm. rich, I think what is missing is the fact that, yes, we absolutely need the fintech to transform the world of, of financial services. But as we do it, we, we, we would need to do it intelligently. So mm -hmm. then I would transform the whole problem and say the startup I would do would be around how do I capture and leverage uh, the, the data that's available to create more intelligent and more targeted services that are mm -hmm. also more useful to the company and or the individual in the setting. Now, that's very generic. And of course, we can pick a certain area and, sure. and focus on it. But I think the theme, that theme is missing in general. So to, to give you a mm -hmm. quick example, uh, there has been a big, uh, in crypto, there has been a big transformation from uh, proof of work like Bitcoin to proof of stake. Sure. In, in, the, in the proof of stake world, there's a heck of a lot more data available that you can tap into and that can tell you a lot about what's going on, what are the activities, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. Nobody is really tapping into that in a meaningful way and saying, okay, here's how you visualize what's happening. Here's how you help regulators understand what's going on. Here's how, how you help people get more comfortable with what's going on. Uh, that is right now to me an, 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 an open gap in terms mm -hmm. of uh, something that is needed by many, many, many fintech companies, but they have no clue in doing it because this, this is like the the the, the uh, digitization or digital transformation, right? Many people approach digital transformation as, hey, I can take workflows and automate them through digitization and didn't realize that if they do that without capturing the data and grabbing the insights, what they're doing is they're, they're, they're becoming blind when they operate in the space because to give you a quick example, uh, when you have a lot of humans doing stuff, yes, it might mm -hmm. be slow, it might be inconsistent, it might be expensive, but guess what? It gives you insights as to what is going on. Why did customers leave me? What are they unhappy about? What is not working? Uh, why is it not working, right? Well, okay, now I've automated that workflow through digitization mm -hmm. and I've gone blind because I no longer understand when things go bad. Why are my customers leaving? Why are they unhappy? What do they <laughs> like about the competitor, right? So. There's a similar thing here that is threatening to happen in the world of fintech. And we seem to be making the same error all over again. Instead of taking the opportunity to say, let's instrument this properly so that we're grabbing the data and we're injecting enough intelligence to keep visibility and understanding, we're kind of going down the, the black box approach, which is not a good thing. Sure. So to me, that a, a, a startup in that space would be something I would go after. Gotcha. Interesting. I think uh, I like the example you gave in the uh, crypto space uh, because, you know, even though it's out of favor these days as an industry, there's a lot of cool, cool stuff in there. And you're right. They take a look at it, uh, not necessarily from a data uh, perspective and how to utilize data, but more, you know, some other maxims. And so, yeah. so this and we all know actually... without, without data, without data, today's AI is not going to work. So, don't make that mistake. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Makes perfect sense. So my last question before I let you go, my dear friend, is uh, you essentially laid it out, right? You said you need a human or it needs to be human-centric. Uh, a lot of people might say, well, you know, they're going to take out the human out of the equation at some point. Uh, this dystopian world versus uh, the utopia and of course, you know, the hype is there, right? You know, Elon Musk is saying, uh, let's just uh, put a moratorium on AI. Of course, he's more referring to the LLMs, which is the current uh, soup du jour. Uh, 
but yeah, what do you think? You know, are we going to be slaves to the AI overlords in, you know, five years, 20 years, whatever? Or what is this all about? Well, I mean, so, so, so it's a, it's a two edged sword. So I, I will tell you the following from the perspective of sentience or these machines suddenly becoming conscious and developing their own agenda and all that, <laughs> we are so, so, so far away from that, that it's ridiculous. <laughs> these, these machines are so knowledge free and so stupid and so dumb <laughs> and no, so uninformed. Like there, there, there's, you know, I mean, I can, I can give, I can spend hours telling you how generative AI can generate stuff and and by the way, the, the technical term that I like a lot is stochastic parrots, right? These mm -hmm. these large language models are stochastic parrots in the sense that they don't understand what they're saying. They're just producing a sequence of, yeah. of words <laughs> that's been fine-tuned to match what they have seen in, in, in the data, right? And sure enough, for many tasks, this is appropriate, this is good, but the ability to go off course and start spewing stuff that doesn't make sense. If you make one wrong guess in that sequence, you're off on a tangent that has nothing <laughs> to do with the real answer, right? So to me, the fear that this technology becomes smarter than humans is unfounded, is silly. I think these machines will have a huge impact, significant impact on the knowledge economy. Uh, in fact, uh, I think they will do a lot of acceleration, but not replacement. So uh, you will still need the human to check the output. And that human will very frequently find many errors in that output. Mm -hmm. And by the way, whenever they catch the output, the machine gets better and better and better over time. And how long it takes to, to get good enough, et cetera, is, 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 a, is up, up for grabs. We don't know. The second uh, thing that I will say, so, so no fear of the machines becoming too smart. And by the way, the mm -hmm. analogy I'll use is chess players. Back, you know, 40 years ago, there was a claim in the scientific community that, hey, if we can make a machine that plays chess better than humans, we would have cracked the intelligence problem. <laughs> Guess what? The cheapest chess player today can actually beat grandmasters at chess, right? The machine can play chess way better than a human can. And nobody stops today to think about, whoa, will the machines replace me or, hey, have they cracked intelligence? Or are machines smarter than humans? We just realized that a machine approach to chess is better than a human playing chess, as far as we can tell. Uh, but that says nothing about general intelligence, right? We have a chess mm -hmm. player. It's amazing. But it, can't, it doesn't know anything about the next task. Now, are we going to become slaves? Uh, my answer is, that's up to us, right? So some might argue that, I'm a slave to my mobile device where my calendar is there. It tells me where to go. It tells me how to get there. It tells mm -hmm. me everything. And I'm so dependent on it uh, because it's really good at these tiny tasks, even though it doesn't understand what I'm up to. Mm -hmm. It's actually very helpful to me. Now, is that is that a, a very serious assistant or is that a master slave? I don't know. I mean, you can you can argue that somehow <laughs> This device controls my life, right? In in many aspects and knows a heck of a lot about me. Uh, the last quote I'll leave with you is one of my favorite quotes. To me, AI is not about replacing the human with a robot. It's about taking the robot out of the human. A lot mm. of the tasks should be done by robots, should not be done by humans. They are much better at it. And that frees us up to do a heck of a lot more stuff. 